Okay, so you read the title, How Do Big Tech Companies Manage Their Software Development Process to Serve Millions of Customers? Well, in this video, I'm going to give you a quick tour of how big tech companies manage, develop, produce software and deliver them to millions of users. My name is Salim Haddad. I'm a senior software engineer in Dubai at one of the biggest companies in the MENA region. When I joined a large scale company for the first time, it was so overwhelming for me to understand the entire process end to end. And in this video, I'm going to answer three main questions that hopefully will connect the dots for you. The first question is how the teams are structured. Next, how do engineers develop features? And how do engineers ship them to production? Have your cup of coffee and join me on this quick tour. Let's start with the team structure. It's very normal at big tech companies to see 10, 20, or even more than 100 teams all working on the same product, like Snapchat, or multiple products at the same time, like Google, where they work on YouTube, Gmail, Workplace, and so on. Regardless of how many products a company might have, normally the structure of any team will consist of the following. And I'm gonna use visuals to draw and illustrate what I'm talking about. So ideally we will have about four to six software engineers with different roles and seniority. We have one dev, two, three, four, and those can be front end, back end, full stack, all right? And also we will have an engineering manager with a technical background, ideally. So an engineering manager will be responsible for managing the team and the technical side as well, and put them in a different color. And also a product manager, who's the person who sets the direction of the product they're working on. So I'm gonna put product manager here with a different color. Also, you might find in, in the same team, a product designer where they some companies, they call them UI UX researcher, who's basically the one who connects the dots between the product's manager mind and the engineer's mind through visuals. So I'm put product designer here and I choose a different color as well. And in some cases, you also might find a dedicated data analyst with the team. This data analyst will help the product manager normally to gain insights and more data on the user behavior, on the experiment or the future impact on the customers. Also, in some cases, we might find you where your job is to subscribe to my channel and like the video if you find it useful. Just kidding. So this is basically the structure of this team or a specific team in a company. All in all, the ideal team size should be between seven to nine members and might go beyond that depending on the case and the requirements. Software engineers in this case are responsible for developing features of applications or services they normally own. The functionalities they develop are tied to the domain they are working on and should contribute to a set of agreed OKRs and goals. Wait, wait, wait. What are domains and OKRs? Okay, let me explain with an example. Let's take the YouTube company as a case. So I'm gonna put this a little bit away for now, because we will use this again in structuring the teams. Resize it a little bit and move it down. And let's start with YouTube as a case. The YouTube company has several products working on all under the umbrella of YouTube application and might be structured into the following areas, where this sometimes we call them domains or verticals, all under the tech department and product. So you might find an infrastructure team sits at the core of every other verticals, something like this. So we have infra team or infra vertical or core team, or some companies, some companies call them foundation, where simply their job is to make sure the infrastructure is up and running all the time, all the time, 24 seven. Each domain normally consists of several sub teams, like the following. I'm gonna resize this a little bit, use it here. And we're gonna assume we have the same structure of the team, but in, in different cases, you might have less engineers, more engineers, just to be aligned here. For example, the subscription team might have two teams, two sub teams. Growth might have one, consumption might have two or three, and recommendation might have four, for example. Each team will be targeting a specific set of goals. We normally call them OKRs, objectives and key results, which contribute to the overall company's vision and revenue. The subscription vertical 
Each team might have a different goal, but let's say the first team has a goal of increasing the premium customers who subscribe to a YouTube premium. And consumption team might be responsible for increasing users' consumption through different features across the video, and so on. Also, keep in mind that some teams are product teams and some of them are platform teams. In a very short explanation, product teams are working on features that are normally end users facing, customer facing, whereas platform teams are working on no normally on internal tooling for the company. By the way, this is very, very simplified version. The real world is much bigger. Just in fact, it's estimated that YouTube alone has more than 2,500 engineers working together on the same platform. Now, normally at the vertical level here, and here and here, you might also find product and engineering directors who are managing the entire verticals direction, strategic planning, resources management, and many more. So in, in each vertical, you might have one or two, ideally two, one for engineering, one for product uh, director. So I'm gonna just add them here for reference. So we have one direct, sorry, what, not this one, one director and another director here for product. Just keep in mind that this is, will be replicated across every other vertical. So when you join, some companies are going to pre-assign you to a specific team that has some capacity shortage, and some companies will pitch different teams and give you the space to choose which team you would like to contribute to. Alongside the engineering team structure, you are also expected to be part of the global chapter based on your core role, backend chapter, infrastructure chapter, mobile, and so on. These chapters, let me draw them here, and then they're normally kind of a vertical. So this is chapters. Chapter means is a group of specialized expert engineers in the field set together to work on global initiatives, share knowledge, and many more. Now we understand the team structure. How do engineers develop features? Well, I'm gonna put this a little bit away and then just focus on one team only. And as I mentioned earlier, each team ideally owns one service, but might contribute to shared ownership services, repos such as the mobile app code base or the infra, for example. Normally, a product manager comes up with an idea to experiment with after doing some research or interviews with customers or competitor analysis. By the way, I'm going to dedicate a, a specific video on explaining what is the product manager's role and main responsibility. That will be in another video, so make sure to subscribe to the channel for the upcoming videos. The product manager normally collaborate with the product designer to implement this feature or the idea visually, so it makes it easier to collaborate and pitch the idea to the engineers and make it easier to understand the requirement. Engineers and engineering manager try to understand the requirements and what is needed to change in the code base to make it happen. For example, let's get back to the subscription team at YouTube. The PM might come with an idea to implement a feature to animate the subscription button every time the YouTuber says, subscribe to my channel. Once the entire team agree on this idea and the expected outcome, engineers and EM will take the responsibility of developing this feature step by step in a small iterative way. So for example, for this feature, the team might need to develop a machine learning model to detect at which timestamp the YouTuber says the phrase subscribe to my channel in different languages, and then take that as a trigger to the mobile or front end to animate the button and then measure the impact. So this feature might need several collaborations with other teams. Sometimes the team who is working on this feature might need to write an RFC. What is an RFC? Basically, it's, it's a request for comments, which is a document the team who's owning the feature will write to explain what the system design change across multiple services or teams. Also might include service change and also the rollout plan. The whole idea of writing an RFC is to raise awareness of the context of the required changes to deliver a certain feature. And in this example, the engineers who wrote the RFC suggested implementing a machine learning model might get a response from other, other team that say, hey, this model is already implemented somewhere else in the company. You don't need to develop it again from scratch. And a quick advice here, make sure to know this process very well at your company. 
and you will thank me later. So once the idea becomes solid and everyone align, aligns on the expectation and the outcome, the engineers start contributing to their service or repository and push the code into smaller, multiple, uh, small PRs and write automated tests in the same PR, uh, whether it's unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end tests, and so on. So this is how it goes. The engineers start contributing to their repo or repos, depends on how many servers they have, and they uh, write pull requests every time they make a change. They pull, they make the change into one PR, they get approved, and then they merge it and the second PR and so on. Each PR ideally should get at least one review before merging it to the main branch, assuming the team also is working in the trunk-based development. So for example, if this engineer here who wrote the first PR, then ideally, at least one or two other engineers need to review this PR and approve it. And once the PR got merged into the main, it triggers a chain of reaction of the CI/CD pipeline where new code, the new code that this first one is developed will be tested using the automated testing and then deployed to production. Now, you might ask a question, how engineers manage their infrastructure? Normally at big tech companies, as I said, the infra team here provide a very valuable tooling for engineers to operate and, and utilize the resources on the cloud. So companies might use Terraform or any other form of infrastructure as code where the engineers will write what they need in their service. For example, in this repo, I need maybe, let's say, 100 or one gigabyte of CPU, one gigabyte of CPU, one gigabyte of memory, and, and, and I want to distribute that to 10 pods if, if it's running on Kubernetes, for example. All of this is managed using infrastructure as code. So normally at large scale companies, you will never find engineers do that manually on the GUI, all in code. And this is normally inside the same repository or a different one. All right, so now we have a complete feature. We want to start releasing it to customers. How do engineers ship them to production? Well. There are multiple strategies big tech companies follow to release new features to customers, including names like phase rollouts, A-B testing, feature flags, um, you know, canary releases, blue-green deployment, internal testing, user segmentation, and you name it. For example, feature flag is a simple way that you can put your changes of code behind a Boolean flag. And if something goes wrong, after releasing the feature, you can quickly disable the flag to minimize the negative impact on the customers. All of these strategies, ensuring smooth rollouts and minimizing the risk of breaking any existing experience to the customers. Keep in mind, there's no best strategy to follow all the time here. It's case by case, and it's based on the risk tolerance of the team and the future. Maybe in this one, it's not a tier one. If it's a tier one feature, then it might need more careful release plan. But if it's tier three or four, you might go with a simple canary release or feature flag. However, at big tech scale, it's almost always recommended to avoid big bang feature delivery without a safety flag, at least to disable in case something went wrong. There's a lot to talk about the release strategies, but I'll keep them for a different video. Now you might ask, how do engineers know if something went wrong? This is where the fun part is. Normally and ideally at big tech companies, uh, solid monitoring and observability tools exist to help engineers monitor their application, understand performance, detect and debug issues, and trigger automated alerts in case something went wrong based on the health metrics they choose to rely on. And in general, all engineers are expected to know how to use them very, very well. Let's take an example where, for example, for this simple case of showing the animated button to the users, um, it might affect a certain metrics the subscription team normally have. And let's say they, they monitor the number of subscription across multiple uh, regions. And if they see a drop in one uh, region, then it might be a good indicator that this is because of the recent deployment and in this case, the, com the, the team will immediately switch the flag off if they know that this is related to that recent deployment. Again, as I said, there's a lot to talk about this, so, but I will give it to a different video. All right, we have talked quickly about the process inside big tech companies and how things are running internally. 
If you enjoyed this video and planning to join a big tech company in the future, I'm sure you will love this video on five preparation tips you can do to take your interview experience to the next level. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Have fun.